All right. So um, I'm actually really glad that you guys are able to listen to this presentation today. Um, I started working on this project quite a few years ago. And when I started off, I was just looking at K-pop cover dancers. And then over time, I became aware that there is this sort of K-pop adjacent industry. And as I have been working on the K-pop adjacent industry, I've realized, actually, this is like a book project. So what you're hearing today is sort of an outline of different parts that will exist in the book in the future. I have sort of sketched it out, but I really need to send off the first book first <laughs> before I keep working on this one. So um, uh, you can see my title on the screen and uh, I'm going to start my presentation. So with Hallyu 2.0, the world of K-pop suddenly expanded. K-pop was no longer just about acquiring fans and selling MP3 files and securing lucrative advertising deals for the young K-pop idol stars. Curiously, over the past several years, without stopping to ask for permission, new participants have inserted themselves into the K-pop world. Some of these creatives are occupied with making music video reactions, creating educational videos related to K-pop and Korea, manufacturing fan art, providing K-pop tour content, teaching K-pop dance, and even writing magazine articles and books about the music. In this paper, I examine this side culture. I'm um, sorry, where was my place? Uh, um, both inside and outside of Korea. So I've been spending a lot of time doing Twitter research for this. And I posed a question on Twitter. I said, what do you guys think about unofficial merchandise? And Rimi Jane, who is a full-time lawyer in India and also writes the occasional magazine article about K-pop responded, as you can see on the bottom of the screen, no pop culture icon or act can exist in isolation without the books, the YouTube reactors, dancers, covers, even fan site photos. It wouldn't be an icon. Creativity inspires more creativity, even creative ways to earn money. So Jane gestures at the depth and breadth of content that supports the Korean popular music artists beyond the content that is actually produced by the artists and their own agencies. The ways that the fans are inserting themselves into this K-pop adjacent industry is fascinating. However, taking popular culture texts and transforming them, creating additional areas of activity associated with fandom is neither new nor K-pop specific. John Fisk called this a shadow cultural economy with its own systems of production and distribution. But what in 1992 may have operated as a shadow cultural economy has grown in the context of K-pop until due to its visibility, its importance, and the large number of participants, it leads me to term this the K-pop adjacent industry. And you can see the way that I'm conceptualizing this on the screen. I'm sorry, I can't see, but you guys can see me talking to you, right? Because like normally you'd be able to see me as like a little thing in yes, the corner. Yes, yes, you're right. Oh, Cedar, okay, good. You, you I, to can't, the side. I can't see anything. So like, I didn't know if you guys are seeing okay, me. Okay, <laughs> yep, you're here, we're here, no problem. Okay, good. Um, so you guys can see the way that I'm conceptualizing this. So basically, we have all of these fan activities, all of these things that K-pop fans do, and we have the K-pop insiders in the center. But then we also have this little ring around the K-pop insiders, and that's the K-pop adjacent industry. So, it, you know, when we were in the, the early years of Hallyu, um, there were scholars that wrote about how there are substantial limitations of the Korean wave in facilitating meaningful transcultural practice and dialogue. But what I'm going to discuss now is that there's actually this fascinating contradictory transcultural practice and dialogue that has emerged from this fan activity. 
at the same time that K-pop is actually frequently criticized for being a monolithic, money-driven, manufactured approach to artistic creation, the K-pop industry is actually supporting and supported by a multitude of associated limelight eschewing and limelight seeking artists, educators, and performers working in fields as diverse as fashion, video production, choreography, art, tourism, and education. So this um, research for this paper actually grew out of this long-term project on K-pop cover dance. And you can see this exact same graphic um, in the uh, most recent issue of Transactions on the Royal Asiatic Society's uh, journal. So you should get a copy of that. Um, so the, this long-term project is looking at K-pop cover dance, and I started this in, in 2015. And as I began to research cover dance, I was really interested, like, what are people learning about Korea in the process of doing cover dance? Or are they even interested in learning about Korea? But, and so I started following these top cover dance teams. And over time, I realized that the teams that continued to produce cover dances were learning how to partially monetize their fandom activity. So for those of you who don't know, if you upload a cover dance to YouTube, uh, the, the, the uploader does not get any monetization for that. Even if there are, you know, 5 million views of that cover dance, and you can see here with the view count, these are single video view counts, you know, with, with you know, 7 million, 3 million views. Um, even if they have that many views, they don't get any um, YouTube ad money for those views. Instead, the, those views are automatically assigned to the copyright holder for the song. So it's assigned back to BTS or Blackpink or Momo Land. And so they had to figure out other ways to monetize their activities, otherwise they couldn't keep them going. So I created this visualization. Um, so, so first I was just looking at cover dancers. So like, how are they monetizing it? But then I realized there are all these other people that are also monetizing their um, contributions to K-pop. Because really, we have to think of K-pop not as something that's just being made by the insiders, but actually it is being created by some of these fans in cooperation, or maybe with no cooperation. Um, and so fans are not just like passive consumers of these cultural products, like they're actually making K-pop. And so these, I, these are like areas of uh, activity and work. So if I start from the brown area, um, so we have these people who are like curators of fandom activity or people who get into star production and management. Um, obviously, Cedar Bell, sorry, just the um, PowerPoint is very blurry for us. So you're going to have to identify all of the text. We can't read anything on it. Oh, okay. That's all right. Um, so I'm going uh, around starting from the, from the brown ones. And so we've got star production and management. So some people uh, get involved in actually managing um, K-pop. But um, then we have the, the group of educators. So the orange circles represent educators. Educators include people who are producing materials um, to educate people, uh, people who are producing experiences. Um, and then people who are theorists, who are uh, interpreters, who are translators. And so this can mean in the sense of explaining what things mean or in the sense of actually subtitling K-pop content. Uh, and then we get into the light blue area and I've got uh, uh, one for stream punks. These are personalities, they're light blue area. These people want to be seen. So these, these are the people who want to get in front of the camera, personality, stream punks, YouTubers. Um, I, I like using the, the word stream punk because um, Robert Kinsell, who's one of the, the top uh, executives at YouTube, um, you know, talks about the people on the YouTubers as being stream punks. Um, music and songwriting and dance and choreography. And then the dark blue area are people that I'm calling roughly artists. So they're working in clothing, fashion, cosmetics, 
art and creative writing. And by creative writing, I'm, I'm referring to fanfic and um, video and photography. And in that case, we're mostly talking about fan sites. Um, for those of you that don't know, fan sites are people with exceedingly good camera equipment that show up at all the K-pop events take photos and then they make products out of those photos like photo albums or card sets and sell them to the fans who are fans of that particular artist or idol group. So um, throughout this, this paper, I'm talking about this as the general adjacent industry, this sort of network here. So in this paper, I'm arguing that through the love of K-pop, young entrepreneurs are creating a creative, collaborative, cosmopolitan, and contradictory explosion of content that exists in both a symbiotic and parasitic relationship with its host, the K-pop industry. This K-pop adjacent industry demonstrates several simultaneous fascinating areas of activity. First, this industry has created a bridge, an area of interaction, exchange, and education between Korean and uh, Korean musical stars and their non-Korean fans. Second, this industry has emerged as an economically significant aspect of the K-pop ecosystem, even at times in competition with the K-pop insiders. Third, this industry has produced new secondary stars that have made inroads into the world of K-pop insiders. Fourth, this industry demonstrates a future area for tension over ownership of culture. So in this paper, I explore these four interlocking issues through interviews with members of the K-pop adjacent industry and highly engaged fans. I assert first, that the emergence of the K-pop adjacent industry was, um, I should read it off the screen, it'll be easier, <laughs> I, was inevitable due to the unpreparedness of the music management agencies for the actual needs of international audiences. Second, that this industry will continue to expand outside of Korea, but that because it's less necessary than it was before, as many management agencies have caught up, uh, it Third, has to become more creative. The K-pop adjacent industries are going to be pushed into unique and creative contributions to the industry instead of just supplementing the industry. And this makes them actually become sort of pseudo industry insiders and sets the stage for a variety of future legal battles. So um, in this section of the paper, I'm talking about the creation of K-pop affinity spaces, uh, a term that I'm borrowing from um, G, uh, James G. Um, so uh, many of these new earning areas uh, were at least initially spurred by gaps that existed between idols or idols in their company and the non-Korean speaking fandom. So fans wanted to interact with the idols and they wanted to understand more deeply about K-pop or about Korea, but their sources of information and opportunities for interaction were limited. So this vacuum ended up being filled by heavily involved fans, some of whom became uh, the, the early K-pop adjacent industries. So their, their activities were almost akin to crowdsourcing all of the K-pop content that existed beyond music, music videos, and a few items of official merchandise. So these adjacent industries are usually both dependent or parasitic and proponents acting symbolically with the K-pop fan background from which, from which they emerge. So through the creation of affinity spaces, which are these inter interrelated online and offline loci of social and cultural activity centered on common beliefs and interests, the K-pop fan community has managed to overcome the cultural and linguistic gaps between K-pop artists and their content and the international community. So in the early K-pop years, in the 1990s and early 2000s, despite an understanding that international fans were necessary to allow 
for market growth, the industry wasn't actually prepared for what the international fans needed. Um, like they really just thought about it in terms of let's have songs in Chinese or have songs in English. Like they didn't think about everything else that the fans would desire. And since, you know, obviously selling units of music is no longer the major way to earn money in the music industry these days, just preparing musical units in foreign languages obviously was not enough. So um, simultaneously with the widespread adoption of the internet and the advent of online music and video access, this really complex affinity space emerged around K-pop. And so obviously this initially privileged uh, people who have enough mastery of Korean and at least one foreign language to sort of, you know, bridge that gap to, to translate subtitle or otherwise share information uh, often on a, on a volunteer basis. So if you look at the screen right now, I have some examples of some people bridging affinity spaces. So one of my interlocutors, um, a really lovely young woman from Indonesia, explained to me about um, the three largest YouTubers that are operating in Indonesian language spaces talking about Korea and about K-pop. And so the, the largest one with over 2 million subscribers, which is uh, quite, you know, impressive. Uh, it, his name is Korea Romit. His actual name is, is Jong Han Seoul. And he spent about 12 years in Indonesia. Uh, now he's living in Seoul. He became a full-time YouTuber. He shares about Korean culture related information and introduces them to Indonesian viewer, viewers. He uses Indonesian language when hosting his videos. And there are other accounts like Han Yuda or uh, Bandung Oppa. And so these are, are Koreans who are, you know, bridging this gap for Indonesian fans. And then there are also all these people who produce all these books. So last summer I went to um, uh, uh, Kyobo and I got a bunch of books all about BTS. They're all unofficial books. The, the one that, that really makes me laugh is this last one, is learn Korean with BTS Bangtan boys, the fun, effective way to learn Korean. Trust me, nobody is going to learn Korean from this great book. It is definitely not effective. However, you've got all of the lyrics translated for every song that had come out up until that point. And um, so as a resource for fans or as a present to give uh, people that you know who are really you know, excited about BTS, then I suppose it has uh, some value. And you know, there are a lot of K-pop fans who are teaching themselves Korean and you know, it could be a resource, but it's definitely not the way to learn Korean. Um, so a lot of uh, these various people who started out in this sort of role of bridging cultural and linguistic gaps then became sort of transitioned from being fans to fantrepreneurs. Um, so the, these early adjacent industry participants, uh, the ones that made the most money were usually the, the fan sites that I mentioned earlier, these people with the great cameras. Um, and the, the photos that they have captured have created sort of the, the backbone of their capitalization. Um, one of the other examples I wanted to give, um, this is a, a young woman in Indonesia. I've, I've been interviewing her repeatedly. She's very fascinating. She's um, one of the leaders of the largest BTS uh, fan group in Indonesia. And um, she founded this fan group, uh, which she has one co-founder uh, and then she's got several curators that help her uh, producing content. But um, she, she says she did it because she was interested in promoting literacy through people's interest in BTS. Then she is uh, encouraging young Indonesians to be more interested in reading and also expressing their own ideas, writing. Um, and so she created this platform in, in 2016 and she 
this community that she created, they all of these young people are encouraged to be doing things like blogs or and she helps them learn how to write better. And it's really funny because she said, I, I don't have any time for fangirling. You know, I only get to spend maybe one hour a day fangirling and, and the rest of the time I have to spend on other stuff. And she's published three books. The three books are on the on the screen there. Um, the first two books are both published in 2018. One of them was published together with uh, somebody else, a uh, co-author, but um, uh, two of the books she wrote by herself. And um, the if I actually read it from here, probably be clear. But anyway, uh, one of the, the books from 2018 has been translated into Vietnamese. Um, her single authored book from um, uh, 2019 has been translated into Malay. And um, her first book in particular uh, sold 20,000 copies in Indonesia. So this is a, an Indonesian best-selling book. And um, even though she's managed to sell like an astronomical amount of books from an academic perspective, since, you know, we're lucky to get a 2000 book print run, um, even though she's, she sold uh, this amazing amount of books, she actually still has to do other work on the side, um, it's, it's still not enough to actually, you know, live off of. But uh, it's really interesting to see how we actually have these, these people that are out there that are creating this um, really rich content and um, with wonderful goals like literacy. And there are a lot of um, content that where people learn about these different uh, groups through information hubs and the information hubs include things like um, probably most of you guys have seen all kpop.com um, or you know there's soompi.com or koreaboo you know that, those kinds of sites and those sites tend to be really well monetized so if you go there as you can see on the screen as you scroll down through the stories there are you know t-shirts with with Hollywood related slogans or pins or other sorts of things that you can buy on the site and the site is also advertising to you from you know the vitamin shop or whoever has paid for banners on the shop on the site and these same kinds of information hubs also exist in other languages so um uh, there's uh, KGen, uh, which is the French sort of equivalent, um, Korea Zine in Turkish, K Magazine MX in Spanish, you know, all of these different sites create clearinghouses for general information as a source of constantly circulating discourse on K-pop. And, um, and they're also sites of, you know, monetization with uh, a lot of, you know, ads and stuff like that on the sites. So, um, Cedar Bell, excuse yeah. me, Th this is Steve. Mm. Um, for some reason, uh, your PowerPoint's coming through online completely pixelized. Okay, and I have we no can, idea why. I, I don't either. We can read the large headings, uh, but, but anything else, we can kind of see the pictures, but we can't really read anything there. And I just wanted to let you know that we're having a problem with that. Um, not that it's something that, that you've got a problem with on your end. I, it could just be the internet system or something, but just be aware that we're not going to, we're not able to read most of what's on your slide. So you may okay. have to explain a little more to us. I apologize for the interruption. Oh, no problem. Noted, noted. Um, so I, uh, yeah, so when John Fisk was writing and he was like, oh, you know, fan, fan economies are, you know, shadow economies, but actually the economy of K-pop fandom has really emerged out of the shadows and the economy of K-pop in it is actually, it's being used by things like the Korean government to justify the amount of continued um, support that is offered to the industry. And so um, most of you guys probably heard about the Hyundai uh, Research Institute 
uh, report that came out last year and it made all of these you know grand claims about how much money BTS was actually contributing to the Korean economy and of course it sounded quite um, preposterous to me and I finally um, just searched out the report itself it's freely available online um, you can find it quite easily and uh, it's only 15 pages long in Korean and it is the most ridiculous correlation does not equal causation uh, study you have ever seen. I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, research methods that your students, undergraduate students would know uh, don't fly. But um, anyway, you can go check it out. But the truth is, is that K-pop is contributing hugely to the economy. It's just that we can't necessarily say that every um, tourist uh, that comes through the airport in Incheon that is familiar with BTS or likes BTS is actually in Korea because of BTS. Um, that's where it becomes a, a little problematic. And um, so I've been talking to uh, different people, including fans, about the amount of money that is actually being spent by some fans in this uh, area. And um, so on the screen, although apparently you can't read it well, uh, in the white box, I have a, a graphic with one particular highly engaged American fan and the amount of money that she'd spent in the past 12 months. So she had spent $520 on concerts and official merch that she bought at concerts. I am um, 1,100 uh, on official merchandise such as albums, memberships in fan clubs, um, buying things from uh, BT21, things like that. Um, and then she spent 1,600 on group orders. So group orders is one of those things that if you're not a big K-pop fan, you might not be aware of. Um, well, what happens is you have people mainly in Korea who are creating um, really cool K-pop content, such as these fan sites where they create, you know, albums and banners and things like that. And um, how do you get them if you are some random person in Australia or whatever? So what happens is, is that a group order manager announces to everybody on their own list, probably on Twitter as well, and says, I'm doing a group order for this particular product. If you pay before this date, then um, I will bring one into Australia for you as well and then i will ship it to you from my house in australia so what it is is a way to save on shipping so you get a bunch of these things all coming in in one box to australia they arrive at the house of the group order manager and then she sends them in smaller boxes out to all of the different fans who had prepaid for these items and so this highly engaged fan who had spent 1600 in 12 months on group orders and all of this is unofficial merchandise. Uh, then she has $580 on fan art. Again, this is unofficial merchandise, but the difference between when she says group order and when she says fan art is that fan art is something that's be it's an original thing, it's being produced. In her case, she's in America, so she's ordering from fan artists who are in uh, in America who create, you know, cute little buttons or sticker sets or whatever it is. I'll highlight one of those artists later. And then she'd spent a further 218 on iTunes. So that was $4,100 that she'd spent in 12 months just on K-pop. And so that is actually what we're talking about here. That is how this adjacent industry is really cooking along because the adjacent industry is actually more than 2,000 of the money that she'd spent in the year. So more than half of the money that she'd spent in the year was going to other fans um, to you know, produce these, these items. Um, so uh, let me find my place in the paper. Um, so part of turning stars into icons is providing legitimizing discourses that connects the stars to something more than media appearances. And the K-pop adjacent industries are a really big part of that. So it's partially just, 
you know, being able to say this is a lot of money, but then it's also people like um, the stream punks, like DKDK TV. So the YouTuber Danny Kim of DKDK TV has been able to abandon all other kinds of work. He said even in his first months as a full-time YouTuber, he, um, well, I, I spit out a number and he probably doesn't want me uh, to tell you exactly what his answer was, but I said, well, you know, did you, did you make more than 3 million in your first month? And he's like, yeah, of course. So even in his first month, he's able to make more than 3 million. And that's coming in on a combination of money earned from YouTube, money from Patreon subscribers, where people like support uh, the, the ongoing work of somebody and also funds that they receive um, that DKDK TV receives directly from the city of Seoul and from the Korean government because they do a lot of promo for Korea in amongst the, the K-pop content. And so they produce all of these different shows um, they discuss K-pop, Korea-related news on DK News. They carry out street interviews on DK Ass. They interview K-pop stars on DK Interviews. They introduce Seoul on Seoul City Vibes. And they deeply, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and they deeply analyze and explain video content on K-pop Explained by a Korean. And they also introduce things like contests that could send winners to Korea. So in uh, addition, David reacts to K-pop videos and Danny sometimes conducts in-depth interviews. So in repayment for interviewing Danny, I appeared on one of those um, interview shows. So people um, like these stream punks, they're basically taking their knowledge of the media. Danny and David both uh, majored in media studies at Jungang uh, university. Uh, they're taking their, their knowledge of the media and the popularity of K-pop and their status as fluent English-speaking Koreans, and they're making themselves into not just educators, but actually stars in their own right. At this point, um, they have so many subscribers on YouTube, and they're so well known that uh, I would say that the average K-pop um, fan knows them as well as most recently debuted groups. So, um, yeah. Uh, uh, so that's one uh, area of legitimizing um, discourse. Um, and there are a lot of different stream punks that are doing similar things. Um, and of course, uh, you know, still some people that just uh, blog and things like that. Um, another area of uh, the K-pop adjacent industries is producing K-pop experiences. And um, a lot of this uh, connects uh, back to tourism. Um, so I'm gonna give you guys three different case studies. One is the city of Seoul. One is uh, Kim Min Sung of Real K-pop Dance. And then one is actually an American case study for providing K-pop experiences. So the government in Seoul is very keenly aware of how interest in Hallyu and and idle tourism can transform sort of ordinary locations in the city into tourist destinations. So if you go on the website visitsoul.net, you can find a selection of the self-guided tourist courses associated with different K-pop idols. So for example, um, in 2018 and 2019, one of the most popular stars in Korea was Gong Daniel, who was a member of Wanna One uh, that was made by a, a, one of the popular um, uh, audition type um, shows, a, a reality show to make a group. And so demonstrating the, the governmental interest in capitalizing on K-pop and demonstrating Gang Daniel's popularity, the Seoul Tourism Organization designed a special Danity tour. And Danity is the name of Daniel's um, fan club. And so it, it legitimized um, by the Seoul government, the tour gained in significance. So instead of just being an activity for fans, it was actually evidence of Daniel's fame and a demonstration of a new understanding of the role of K-pop in tourism. And the tour itself is relatively simple. Uh, the fans can visit four locations which are associated with a star. There's uh, the website provides a map and information including the connection to Daniel of each location with the address and the hours of operation 
situation. So this is basically, it tells you, um, you know, take subway, get off at this stop, go out, exit this, you know, walk forward 500 feet, you'll see this restaurant on the left, that kind of thing. And um, whether Daniel himself um, approved these four sites or had any sort of connection to the design of the tour is unstated, but the English language copy really suggests Daniel's emotional connection to each location. And so it's basically the Cape K-pop fan tourists are looking for an experience of being part of the K-pop star's ordinary life. To be, you know, there's this, um, you know, feeling of, of proximity and um, closeness through being able to visit these places. And so uh, an example of the advertising copy is they said, oh, the brunch restaurant LH2 in Yeonnam-dong was the location of the meeting between Gang Daniel and his fan, the actress Ra mi Ran, on the entertainment program Weekend Playlist that aired on Saturdays on TVN. Reservations continue to pour in for the table at which Gang Daniel sat. The competition is still fierce among the members of Danity to sit at that very table. So it's not like a particularly exciting location, but it's directly connected to this um, star. And there's other similar tours um, set up by the, the Seoul City government, you know, for fans of NCT or Eyes One or Newest or, or whoever it is. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of a lot of that is just driving um, tourism to random restaurants where stars once ate duck bogey, you know. <laughs> uh, and then there are like more uh, really fascinating, exciting uh, example is um, Kim In Sung, um, is one of my interlocutors, and he has a, a company called Real K-pop Dance. So Kim In Sung himself actually was um, a back dancer for one of the biggest groups in the 1990s and when that group disbanded he was still a young man he decided he would go to college and he studied tourism management and then he went to work at Hana tour which as you know is one of the biggest tour agencies in Korea and he worked there for five years and then he founded his own tour company and his tour company entirely focuses on the k-pop fan tourist so um uh, just a second so you can participate in a full day um, or a camp program, or you can uh, have like a, a very intimate, uh, tailored exploration of K-pop and Hollywood culture. Um, and you can have this embodied experience of learning K-pop dance under the guidance of a former professional backup dancer. So uh, Kim Min Sung has hosted different tailor-made programs in Korea for foreign visitors, including programs to seriously train performers represented by a Malaysian entertainment company, programs for dance schools, and programs for regular school programs on a trip to Korea not unlike what I witnessed when we took my uh, K-pop summer students to the program. Um, so, and then further, he also uh, gets regularly employed by the Wei Bu, by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to go to foreign countries. Um, if the if things were working better, I'd show you the video, but um, he'll go to countries like Indonesia or Malaysia or Brazil, even to relatively small towns, and together with other people, perhaps with a workshop on how to decorate Korean fans, or you can listen to somebody singing Pansori, and you can also have experience of learning to dance K-pop dance. And um, so it's a, you know, free programs going around the world set up by the, the local embassies and consulates. Um, and he's a, a, a big part of their K-pop program. Um, and I'm gonna skip that video. Okay, come on, come on. Okay, and then um, my next case study is Ashley Griffin, and she's in the Dallas area. She's a sort of self-made entrepreneur of K-pop, and so she's experiencing, she's uh, preparing K-pop experiences for people even very far from Korea, because she saw how many fans there were and how hard it was for them to build actual physical community, because they would come together for these really, really expensive concerts, but then that would 
be done. And so she started creating various activities like the one that I think is the cutest is K-pop skate nights. Uh, where you can go to the roller rink and you can skate to K-pop. And um, she's just very good for, for family bonding, you know, because the, the older generation remembers enjoying skate nights. And um, so, you know, there are people like her who are figuring out how to create experiences of K-pop. She also will have like, uh, you know, viewing parties or um, fan uh, cafe events, things like that. Um, so people are making experiences for K-pop even very far from Korea, um, which obviously is, is good for all the people who can't afford to go to Korea. Um, so, and now I get to talk about dance, which obviously is you know, where I started off. So I'm um, being paid to dance. I've got four great examples. First one is One Million. One Million is a dance studio in Seoul. And um, they are, they have um, a, a ton of very qualified, very highly um, Im impressive dancers who are working there as uh, dance instructors. And uh, they also choreograph or dance on um, backup or in music videos with K-pop stars. And even on occasion, K-pop stars will come to One Million's physical location and they will learn a choreography directly from one of the, the choreographers there. And um, One Million puts new videos up every day if you i was if i'd been able to show you the video i made i actually had a, a cute video of them um dancing uh with mass you know they're there right now june it was a video from june 21st and they're there a bunch of people dancing everybody's wearing masks um and uh when i went there last summer oh my gosh there's so many people just lining up in the hallway trying to register for a chance to dance in the studio where their idol had previously danced in the studio with a, a dance instructor who was so proficient that they could even teach idols how to dance you know so um and the front desk staff at one million speaking in chinese Chinese, English, and Japanese to um, all of these different people showing up trying to register for classes and they have to turn people away. So they're making money hand over fist from people who will come even just for one class. Um, uh, another example is Sandy and Mandy. They're twins from Taiwan. They started dancing together, um, uh, doing cover dances uh, when they were about nine years old. Very, very cute. And they've moved on to being sort of like reality television stars. And they also appear in a lot of advertisements uh, in Taiwan. And so they've taken their fame that they produced by being um, very well-known cover dancers and, you you know, being attractive young women and have managed to parlay that into um, making money through through advertising and product placement. Um, Wavia is another very interesting example. These are, um, it's just two members at this point. They started out with a larger group, um, but Wavia has a private member me platform. And if you pay a uh, for their member me, then you can see uh, special content. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna show you a little bit of a video. I don't know how well this will work. It's only a short content, it, um, a, a short link. It'll give you an idea about Wavia. So um, 
after you saw the way that that video sort of transitioned, uh, you probably wouldn't be surprised to know that um, most of Wavia's videos managed to incorporate twerking into a K-pop cover. And um, if you go on their Member Me site, then you uh, can see things like they have a poll, you know, what should we, in our Halloween special video, you know, what should we dress as? Should we be nurse? police woman, bunny girl, cat woman, or something else. And uh, bunny girl won. Um, and I, I, the promo video, ooh, oh, spicy. Anyway, um, so there are people who are taking their K-pop cover dance and they're, they're making money in that sort of way. And, but the absolutely my favorite of all is Saint 319. Um, this is a group of, of young people in Vietnam. Uh, they started out making covers. The covers are amazing. And they added so much more than, um, than you would expect. It wasn't just the dancing. There were whole stories. And their dancing is so high quality. And their video work was so amazing. And they finally realized, wait a second. Like, we're getting these uh, huge views. Uh, we have these great skills and um, they actually transitioned into being a K-pop style entertainment company and if you look uh, on the screen obviously you, you can't read clearly but this is showing their most popular videos uh, that they've uploaded and these are original content 104 million views 58 million views 57 million views 45 million views so they have multiple different artists and groups who are churning out um, uh, videos and and of course you know you can buy the music too um that are very much in a k-pop style um but they're in vietnamese and they are managing themselves and it, it, it's absolutely amazing and and the the whole way that they like form groups and everything there's so many overlaps with the way that things happen and in the k-pop world and um even uh they've covered um as singers uh made new videos of of Korean songs where they will even come to Korea and shoot the music video in Korea because what could be more authentic? Um, and so th they're making money now as stars. They just became the stars. Um, so, uh, and then I'm going on, since I don't have that much time left, to um, merchandise. So could actually K-pop uh, adjacent industry be in competition with the K-pop insiders? Like, yes. At this point, it could be. And um, one of the biggest areas for that is uh, merchandise. So um, fans in particular um, seem to understand the importance of authorized official merchandise, but the cost to, to purchase this merchandise is often quite prohibitive. And many express a lack of confidence that the idols that they love so much are actually benefiting significantly from the merchandise sales. So uh, although in other fan communities, there have been sort of calls to protect fandom as like a gift economy, K-pop fans, like fans of fan fiction in the West, seem to accept that creatives should be paid for their creative labor. So in my interviews with highly invested fans, they explained that they enjoyed supporting other fans who are creating merchandise. And they sometimes mentioned its lower cost and that they would like to keep the funds circulating inside of fan communities. Um, it, to sort of summarize though, their, their line in the sand that they draw is that they want to support legitimate fans. They don't want to support somebody who's in it for a cash grab. You can't be a non-fan trying to make money from fans by producing K-pop, you know, adjacent materials. And um, you're not supposed to be uh, producing something that is a knockoff or too close to the official merchandise because that is unfair. Um, and uh, so the, my case study that uh, I've been interviewing on um, these two young women, um, I've been interviewing Wally uh, Pena and her family um, immigrated from the Dominican Republic. And the two sisters who are 18 and 21 have a thriving business. Um, they have Kofi, which is kind of like buy me a coffee sort of um, tip jar, but they do all of these merch sales where they create um, 
they, they take orders online, they get these things manufactured, they send them out uh, to the, the various fans. And um, one of the things they specialize in is a sort of world of um, very, very cute BTS characters turned into vampires. So like cherubic cheeks, like really big fat cheeks, but like little fangs, you know, uh, as buttons and, and sticker sets and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, the, the question then is, um, what about legal challenges? Because there are people that are out there selling things which are knockoffs and calling them official merchandise, or people that are trying to um, sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, get all, all the money from the, from the K-pop fans. Um, and so there are uh, struggles that are happening in, in various fronts. Um, one of my interlocutors told me about this this uh, young um, man who works in the French market um, sells a lot of clothing and um, K-pop paraphernalia online, uh, claims uh, much of it to be official merchandise, um, and also is a YouTuber. And uh, there are a lot of, you know, sketchy um, uh, quantities that I, I guess I don't have time to go into, but um, there are legal challenges then that are on the horizon. So what do you do when you have uh, these people who are making money, who are doing a cash grab um, without necessarily contributing much to the, the fan community or to K-pop as a whole. So as fans become aware of these violations of the social contract, then you get all these arguments about authentic versus inauthentic merchandise and um, fans reporting people to the companies, asking the companies to sue them. And there, there have been a lot of lawsuits. Um, in cases like this, there aren't usually lawsuits for somebody making buttons of BTS vampires. Um, and uh, fans also will turn on performers or educators um, or artists in the K-pop adjacent sector if they feel like they're misrepresenting their love for BTS or if you're, you know, criticizing a, a group too much or, or whatever it is. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess w there are so many different um, areas in which uh, you have to say like the K-pop adjacent industry can only exist because K-pop exists. And so to what extent do these K-pop stars um, actually own their, their image and their content and their popularity, which is being leveraged to make money for, for people from outside. Um, so just a very short conclusion, these secondary stars and adjacent industry participants of today are the producers, choreographers, directors, and stars of tomorrow. And they're driving K-pop in a really interesting and international direction that I, for one, am fascinated to watch unfold. All right, so that brought me in right at um, 53 minutes, which um, I was told that was about what I was supposed to hit. So, yeah, there you guys are. So if you guys have questions, um, yeah, uh, I guess you do because there's a chat with- a... I have questions. <laughs> I have one question, one question. question. It's not one of those weird comment questions, but it's actually a question. Um, okay, Michael. It's a bit racy, so is that okay here? It may, I'm, <laughs> but it's a legit question. Um, I'll just start, stop me if it's, it has to be privately answered. But I look at Instagram pay models and I have seen adjacent industries grow up and your Wavia example actually struck a chord with me because the first thing I thought of is the fact that lots of these Instagram pay models in Korea, there's this kind of thing going on. Um, a lot of the top ones actually make money on OnlyFans, which you might know is, uh, yeah. you know what I'm talking about. Um, 
which you might know is a way for people to go into private meetings and lots of things happen that can't happen in public. And you obviously know I'm talking about some kind of exchange of sexual visuals or that kind of thing, arrangements on the side. Um, and that I think drives a lot of the industry at the top at certain levels in what I'm looking at. And I've been watching Wavia literally and kind of in a general sense for years. And I've always wondered if that's going on and if there's like a special, you know, a kind of account. And you mentioned meeting people privately. So that's the first thing I thought of. Well, with Wavia, if you look on their member me, there's a certain amount of content that you're able to see on the on the member me even if you're not a subscriber so you can see a lot of the discussions with them or demanding certain types of content demanding i do mean demanding um but you can't actually see the content that's what they're keeping private for the people who mm. actually paid um and apparently they are not as racy as people want them to be so oh. they are constantly being asked to, for example, touch each other more oh. uh, in their videos. And, uh, you know, it's like it, it, they are being pushed in a direction which um, is sort of borderline, you know, uh, sex work. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, it's only one of the ways that cover dancers have found to make money. And, you know, Wavia was also making money from, um, for a while, they were teaching classes. They also uh, perform around Korea a lot, um, like uh, college festivals. They'll be like the 6 p.m. thing, whereas the, at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m., you'll have the big act. But at 6 p.m., you might have Wavia, you know, doing cover dances. Hmm. Well, thank you. I, yeah, that answers my question. Um, so I can see that there are lots of questions in the chat. Um, I, am I supposed to scroll up through it? I can't believe to you as awake. Girl, it's like the middle of the night. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I'm just trying, I, yeah, I'm really sorry that you guys couldn't read it. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I have like a really high quality looking thing on my end. So, uh, I could perhaps share the, the PowerPoint on to the Royal Asiatic Society and, and they could, um, maybe send it on to anybody who needed it. Um, Okay. Uh, okay, I'm still trying to find like actual questions here. So Saint 319 was one of the first vi cover videos I watched when I myself began cover dancing here in Australia. It's interesting to see how they developed their career. Yeah, the Saint 319 is just amazing. I really want to go to Vietnam and interview them on the COVID-19. That was kind of my plan for May. <laughs> um, okay, considering all the headlines K-pop fans are managing in the U.S., do you think we'll see an increase in K-pop groups willing to take chances on political stances? Um, could there be anti-fascist or anarchist K-pop groups? Um, I do not see any chance of uh, anti-fascist or anar anarchist K-pop groups appearing. In terms of... Um, Political stances, I actually see even Black Lives Matter uh, stances of K-pop groups as not being a political stance, but being a social stance. That they are saying, you know, uh, that they're taking a stance against systemic racism. They're not trying to take a stance, you know, politically. Uh, it's just that America seems to make things like Black Lives Matter into a political issue instead of a social issue. Really, this is a social issue that needs to be solved uh, you know, through social means, not through political means. Um, and I do think that, that the, from a Korean perspective, that people are looking that, at that as a, 
okay, we have been ripping off black music for years and these are the conditions under which people in the United States are living. So, um, so I, th I think that they're, what they're saying there is in the same sense of their supporting social causes in Korea, where they make donations to uh, support, you know, the elderly or support people with disabilities or to support low income children or whatever it is. So I, I do see it very much as a, we are supporting people who are being disadvantaged in society. We are trying to help amplify a voice for people who need amplification. I don't see it as political. Um, so Suzanne asks, big hit reported revenue for 2019. Does it include YouTube revenue from cover dancers? Yes, absolutely. Um, all of that revenue does go back to the creators. Um, it is, uh, quite amazing how well YouTube can find even a very tiny amount of content that you have included in your video from, um, you know, the, it's web crawlers. It's not, it's not actual people finding it. So, yeah. Um, so yes, it does include that. It is um, passively making money um, off the, the activities of fans. Um, Elliot says he has a question. Steven says he has a question. Maria has a question. Okay, you guys, like, just, you know. Can I ask? Yeah. Can I ask? Do you hear me? Oh. Go ahead, Maria. Uh, yeah. Hello, thank you very much. It was very interesting, very informative. I have a short question. As you said, the uh, K-pop industry started since the end of the 19th. So it's already more than around 20 years, right? So I have a question about the fans. Is it mostly for teenagers and young adults? And when they are grown up, do they stop being such an active fans or, or do they keep interest? So they buy the merchandise, they are involved in the activities. Uh, what is about the age of the um, consumers of all this merchandise and, and the product production? Um, so when K-pop groups debut, they're uh, focused on tween and teen audiences. And as they age, their audience ages with them. So you lose some people over time that people just come up with new interests that they no longer are going to spend so much energy and so much time on on k-pop but some of the groups that have been going on for a very long time uh for example xinhua xinhua doesn't have teenage listeners you know xinhua's listeners are in their 30s even in their 40s you know and people have been with them the whole time. So they have a very, very loyal fan base. Is their fan base growing? Not necessarily. They would have to, uh, what Super Junior has done as they've gotten older and uh, no longer interesting to teenagers in Korea is they've really courted the international market. Like, hey, Spanish speaking world, you know, here's Super Junior, we love you, you know? And so that's a way that they can then increase their, their um, audience and make more money uh, while th within Korea, they're actually, their market share is decreasing because mm -hmm. of the age. And as they get older, um, a lot of people transition away from being an idol and they just become more of like an artist. So you see that with people like, you know, Hyori or, you know, even of course people like uh, Jay Park who was kicked out of an idol group and then comes back on his own terms. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go to Stephen with your question. Please. All right. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Cedar Buff, for a great talk. Um, it's 1130 uh, here in New Zealand. So here I am <laughs> in my bathroom, but what the hell, we're among friends. Um, just wondering, for example, thinking about the people who are active in Indonesia. So I went and looked up uh, Korea Ramit while you were speaking, Jan Hansop, who he also, there's a, something of him with Jokowi, with the president also speaking Javanese. So becoming um, a conduit, he's a bridging person. He's not just K-pop adjacent. He is functioning very much as a Korea, Indonesia um, intermediary, right? And I'm also just wondering what 
the differences between outbound and inbound are for external markets. So you have Indonesians who are have developed knowledge of Korea as opposed to Koreans who develop knowledge of Indonesian and their different functions for the, the local markets. You're muted, I think. On as a different way to look at these industries. Um, yeah, I hadn't really thought about that yet as a way to conceive of it, but I can definitely see how uh, that's an important a important way to, to for me to to check this out. Um, I think I should get back to you on on Facebook or something after I thought about sure. it more, rather than just like meandering in front of everyone, which I'm too good at doing. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot, you said you had a question. Are you still there? Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Yep. Okay, um, so I kind of posted my, my question in the chat as well, but I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, I'll just read off my, my response here, about how K-pop adjacent industries um, at their core are still dependent on the main K-pop industry and like the idols themselves being marketed as products or like their kind of, you know, image of, it, of being close to the fans or whatever kind of thing. And so with, especially with like groups like, like say 319 and then the, the production values and stuff like that, how they're getting like um, very professional and stuff like that. I'm wondering if you think there's like a possibility of the, the K-pop adjacent industries kind of divesting from K-pop or becoming something different. And like, in fact, I, I don't know, taking, taking the skills they learn or like the cultural capital they gain in order to like become something independent. Well, I mean, I, I do think that groups like Saint 319 are becoming something independent, but at the same time, like their, they themselves, their interest was K-pop. They loved dancing to K-pop and they like that style of music. So they've become their own thing, but it's still, you know, close enough to K-pop that they can market to audiences in Vietnam who want something that kind of looks like K-pop, kind of sounds like K-pop, but maybe is sung in Vietnamese um, or maybe they want to support, you know, homegrown stars. So I, I don't think there's a big reason for them to completely divest, both because that's the kind of artistic form that they were attracted to in the per first place, and also because it's a, a sort of marketing technique that gets them to the sort of audience that, that would be interested in their work. Although a lot of their independent work is much more on the side of like ballad than uh than dance which is sort of interesting but they they still get massive views and it sounds like you know and it's produced like like k-pop ballads um okay so i'm looking in the chat here uh k-pop reaction youtube um uh, a lot of reaction videos, people actually are able to uh, monetize those videos. And that's the reason why you see a lot of like uh, K-pop cover groups then will also have reaction videos. Because if you make enough sound over the top of it and you put that original video as just like a small part of the screen, then you can beat those YouTube web crawlers and it can still be monetized as your own content instead of being, you know, uh, copyright assigned to the copyright owner. And um, so I find uh, reaction uh, videos to be rather painful to watch, but there's a couple of really good articles that are out about reaction videos. And if you, uh, send me an email, I can send you the PTS. Um, okay, Leora said, do I see a K-pop related surge in commercial venues to learn other Korean cultural traits like traditional uh, music, language, or food? I think that there is room for people to move into a K-pop adjacent industry teaching people things like how to make kimchi as long as you're in a big enough commercial, uh, a big enough population center that you could, you know, reach a lot of people. I don't know if you'd be able to do that as your only source of income, but I mean, I think you could make some money off of that. Um, certainly, uh, Leora, 
you know, in, in Israel and, and here in the United States that we have just a huge interest in students showing up for classes on, on Korea and learning the Korean language. So it's been uh, really amazing. Um, just the, the drive and the educational desires of young people because of this stuff. Um, oh, Suzanne suggested people could follow up with me on Twitter. Yes, I'm on Twitter, at the K-pop prof. <laughs> the K-pop prof. Somebody else was already at K-pop prof, so I had to be the K-pop prof. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay. Um, yeah. There, there's a lot of comments on the uh, on the chat as we're going down. One one thing during your lecture, Cedar Bow, because mm -hmm. we couldn't, for some reason, whatever, we couldn't read the PowerPoint. People were wondering if you could send that PowerPoint file via the chat before we close the meeting tonight. Um. If, if not, we'll deal with it on the RAS. Uh, uh, website uh, when we post the video. I mean, I would be distracted for a couple of minutes while I like created a new copy of it and deleted okay. extra slides and stuff like that. I mean, no, that that's that that's a lot of work to do. This I hour. mean, if anybody emails me and and wants it, I can send it after I've cleaned it up and and hey, gotten how, rid how of it. How can they email you? Um, so uh, cedarbow at gmail dot com or c dot at gmail dot com. So, okay, yeah, Thank and you. and the the Asiatic Society also has my uh, my email. So if you didn't catch uh, if, that, yeah, if you uh, didn't if you didn't catch it, send us a, an email at our office email address, and uh, Joanne, who is our program coordinator in the office, will try and field all of those and get them on the cedar bow. Jinx. So yeah. <laughs> Is there any other question at this point? Um, I don't see anybody frantically waving. Uh, thank you, Cedar Bow. Oh, uh, Raymond is, is frantically waving. Oh, is Raymond frantically uh, waving? I don't see Raymond. Raymond, unmute your mic and ask your question, please. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for that. I'll try not to take up too much time. All right. We've been. Uh, going on for quite some time. But big thank you, Cedar, and hello to everybody around the world. Uh, my question is going to involve the concept of hybridity in this adjacent industry. And apologies in advance, we're gonna to have to do a little bit of name dropping. So um, I've been uh, running a K-pop group for five years now. And unusually, aside from performing, I also run events on a non-profit basis, just to under underline that. And so to give you one example, last year, I devised the first ever Welsh National K-Pop Championships and a major partner organization was the um, Republic of Korea's cultural arm, the Korean Cultural Center. And I've been working with them on other projects as well over the past couple of years. So basically I'm wondering in your observation in this adjacent industry, how much of a role have you been seeing um, the Korean government, if I could put that in inverted commas, through their cultural arm or directly involved in, in these events? And uh, just to add also onto your point about what are people learning about Korea in addition to K-pop, for this Welsh National K-pop Championships, we sort of converted it also into a career in Wales day. So we had uh, traditional performances, in addition to the K-pop Championships, we had Korean food, handbok try-ons, language sessions, and we even had the Lord Mayor of Cardiff come along to open up the proceedings. So it was a very, very high profile event. So to summarize the question again, um, what role do you see in this adjacent industry of the Korean government in its various forms taking place? And um, globally, not, I've just given you the example from my country, but what have you been seeing elsewhere globally? Well, um, actually, I should direct you to my article in the most recent edition of Transactions of the Royal Asiatic Society, because that article specifically talks about the Korean government using K-pop for cultural diplomacy, for soft power, the ways that the government will spend money on events, uh, on encouraging people to do things like cover K-pop. 
and why it is that they would do that. So um, the interesting thing is, is we do see these Korean cultural centers doing things like sponsoring cover dance um, contests, or uh, in Vancouver, they even had a, uh, a kimchi contest where you could bring your, your kimchi for, you know, who made the best kimchi? Um, obviously, Vancouver's got more uh, Korean population, you know, more people who might be, you know, capable of, of doing such a thing. Um, but we don't see the government doing a lot of encouraging people to make products like, you know, these different fan art products. Because that's where you get into this real gray area. When somebody's covering the K-pop dance, they are literally performing an advertisement of Korea on the street where they're covering that dance. And so from the government's perspective, it's great to encourage that kind of activity. Like, yes, go out in public and make K-pop look exciting and turn people onto this music. But it would be a far different thing for the government to get involved in like, oh, let's have a, a fan art contest. Like, I mean, I, I think that they probably see that as like, oh, well, this could be really fun and it could encourage a lot of people. But on the other hand, like who actually owns the, the likenesses and the, the iconography of these groups? Because they use the actual iconography, which is often trademarked, you know, by these, by these groups. So, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question fully, but, but you should definitely read that article. <laughs> Um, Sinabad, one more question as well. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm kind of thinking about like the the, the um, potential of the adjacent industries as like a sort of social enterprise, right? When we're talking about um, the the Indonesian woman who you interviewed who put out the books for and used K-pop to like promote literacy, kind of thing. But I'm also like kind of on the opposite end of that is like how those kinds of ventures like flop where it's like when you use K-pop to like learn about something or like, you know, learn Korean through BTS or whatever kind of thing. And that those are like not up to standard or they're not, like not effective in what they're trying to do. And so I wonder if you could see, like, I wonder if it's possible to trace like a trend with that, like where it's like when people take K-pop and apply it to their own local context, it seems to be effective. Whereas when it's like, oh, we want like, we're like cultural outsiders, but we want to use K-pop to introduce Korean things, but we're not Korean, then it kind of like doesn't work. Do you feel like that's like kind of a, a, a rule or a trend or? Well, I mean, I, I think the author of this book actually is Korean, but I think that the author of this book has no understanding of how to learn Korean as a foreigner or how to introduce Korean language to non-Korean speakers. And so, yeah, I do think that they just jumped in there as a sort of cash grab, like, you know, oh, this is a way for me to make money, you know? <laughs> like, um, so I'm not, uh, I mean, I think that in general, the fans themselves sort of regulate this because the fans do not, um, they don't respond well to the people who seem to just be using K-pop or using BTS. And they see that they, if the fans perceive inauthenticity in the actual devotion to K-pop of the person producing the stuff, then it, it just doesn't fly. Um, a lot of these people who are just trying to get in as a cash grab, they, they don't understand the lingo that, and they're trying to have a conversation in kind of like a, kind of like a foreign language with these fans who are like, okay, if you said it like that, you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, look at the cover of this book learn Korean with BTS Bangtan boys. Like, this is not the way that BTS fans in English are gonna say, like BTS Bangtan boys is not, you know, like, oh, okay, you don't, you don't actually know BTS. Thank so. you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Cedar Bao. We appreciate you getting up so early in the morning in Indiana. Not, uh, not my favorite time of the day, but thanks for joining us tonight. We really appreciate that. Um, 
Uh, let's see, somebody's saying something in the chat. Oh, yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, okay. Um, I need to make some announcements so that we can be informed about what's coming up. Uh, this coming Thursday is our literature club gathering. It will be on Zoom. And then uh, uh, on July 7th, uh, our next lecture will be by uh, Joey Rosatano on the Jeju Island Henyo. And uh, on July 14th, which is exactly one week later because of time scheduling, uh, Joseph uh, John will uh, share his paper on exploring the Korean diaspora through Korean Cubans. And so that ought to be, both of those ought to be interesting. Uh, and we hope you'll join us for those. You can go to the uh, RAS Facebook page uh, or the website at raskb.com and pick up the links on those to get to the uh, Zoom uh, meetings. Uh, we will say good night. Thank you very much.